Well, it's great to see everyone out, uh, everyone who could make it. Um, always happy to gather, even when it's a small class. Uh, you know, this is this is still encouraging to me because this is you know easily triple the size of my class at Mount Zion. So this is this is a good thing. Uh, last week we left off in Job chapter twenty-two. So if you'd like to turn over with me there, we had just read the first opening uh, passages. So Job chapter 22. And so we had seen that this is beginning another section here in Job chapter 22 of Eliphaz speaking again, one of Job's friends. And basically, Eliphaz seems to think that Job is arrogant. He thinks that Job is being arrogant, that he's making some, himself out to be you know, such a righteous man that it's, there's no possible way that these consequences could be a result of his own actions. He, you know, because he's so righteous, right? That seems to be how Eliphaz is viewing this. And so he's trying to tell Job, look, you, you have a very inflated opinion of yourself. Clearly, you've done something that has earned God's wrath, and now you're suffering for it, right? And so that's kind of how he began here in the opening chapter. And that's what he had said when he's making the point in verse 4. He says, is it because of your reverence that he punishes you? That he enters into judgment against you? So Eliphaz is trying to make the point to Job that, you know, look... <laughs> You don't get punished for being such a wonderful, wise, reverent person. God-fearing men don't get punished like that, right? But he's making this assumption that Job is suffering because it's a punishment. He thinks that there can't be any other explanation for this series of events that have occurred to Job, but divine retribution, right? That's the only thing that this could possibly be. And so he's building everything off of that. He's building all of his assumptions off of that. And his point is that there's no way that someone who has earned such a bad punishment could be so righteous, right? And so that's the way that Eliphaz is viewing this situation. And that's the way that he starts out this speech with that assumption in mind. And so with that, let's go ahead and read the next few verses here. So let's read from verse 5 down to verse 12. Eliphaz says, Is your wickedness not abundant? And is there no end to your guilty deeds? For you have seized pledges from your brothers without cause and stripped people naked. You have given the weary no water to drink, and you have withheld bread from the hungry. But the earth belongs to the powerful man, and the one who is honorable dwells on it. You have sent widows away empty, and the strength of orphans has been crushed. Therefore traps surround you, and sudden dread terrifies you, or darkness that you cannot see, and a flood of water covers you. Is God not in the height of heaven? Look also at the highest stars, how high they are. So we'll stop there for just a second. So, thinking back, to previous speeches that Eliphaz has given us, that we've studied, that we've reviewed, what seems to be a big difference between what he's saying here versus what he's said in the past? Can you spot a key difference? Yeah, he's good. Oh, no, go ahead. Was he going to say something? I hear him say. <laughs> well, I was just going to say that he's, they, they started off more timid, yeah. and he's just saying, you, you're... You've done these things. He's like got very specific sins he's done, even though he doesn't know because these aren't true. But he's very yeah. specific. You, you've, you uh, you know, just robbed people and taken away their stuff. And... Yeah. Eddie, what were you going to say? About the same thing. About the same thing? Yeah, and, and that's really what it is, is in the past he's saying, you know, you know, he was more vague, you know, you need to repent of your wickedness or, or whatever you've done. He's, he's kind of kept it vague. But now he's spelling out specific sins. And does he have any grounds for any of these? No. There's no proof. There's no proof of any of this, right? There can't be any proof because they're all false. They're all <laughs> false, right? Yeah. We know from the opening 
of the book of Job, the Job was a very righteous man, and it lists several of the good things that he's done. So we we know that these are patently false, right? And so this is where his friends have gone past just making an assumption to where they're now outright stating falsehoods, right? Now before, Job has, has rebuked them for presuming to know how God judges, right? For speaking on God's behalf as if they understand the mind of God, right? He's gotten on their case about that and saying, you know, what you're saying is not true. Now, maybe we want to be a little bit merciful towards Job's friends and say that they did that with good intentions, uh, even though it was wrong. Or perhaps we could say that, you know, they were assuming it was true and they weren't really realizing that they were saying something false. But here, Eliphaz is flat out making stuff up now. He's just accusing Job of wild things. Look at some of the things that he says. He says that he's seized pledges from his brothers without cause. So he's just stolen from people, right? Stripped people naked, literally taken the clothes from their back, left them with nothing, right? He hasn't been kind to the poor, so he's withheld water and, and bread. So he hasn't fed the hungry or taken care of them. It says that uh, he hasn't taken care of the widows, right? Or the orphans. It says it crushes the strength of the orphans. And so these are just a few of the things that, that he's said. So he's making up all these wild accusations about him. And then at, at the next portion that we're getting into, he's going to attack Job in a different way. But he's made up these terrible things, and a lot of them have uh, roots in the old law where they're very specifically something that you're not supposed to do, right? And one thing that I found that I thought was interesting is in uh let's see is in verse 11 in verse 11 he says um he's talking about things that come upon this wicked man he says or darkness so that you cannot see and a flood of water covers you now i don't i don't know for a fact uh, that if this is what he's getting at but that might be a reference to the flood. Remember, the, the flood came upon the earth because of its wickedness. And he's trying to say how wicked Job must be to have earned such terrible punishment. So maybe that's something he's alluding to. Or maybe he means something else totally different. I don't know. Pat? You know, um, I'm looking at it in a different way. And it's like, if he's calling him his friend, why is he doing all this? And, and if he, he thinks that he's done all this, why didn't he go to him before he got sick? Mm -hmm. He had all these sins that he's supposed to have done. Why didn't he go to him before he was sick and in pain? Because yeah. all this stuff's pretty serious. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a good point. If, if he thought that Job was doing all these things, he didn't call him to repentance before, you know. Matt? Of course he didn't, quote-unquote, know <laughs> that he was <laughs> sinful until the results of his quote-unquote sin that he didn't really do are right. evidenced by him being in these that, that, that's the whole problem right he's just assuming right. all this because he's not because he's having these problems but he never he never saw evidence of this because it never happened right yeah and i mean this is this is really like if, if we're talking about new testament application you know this is where we can easily build up an assumption and it can get ourselves in trouble you know um I, I was trying to think of a good example, and so I just made something up. But, you know, suppose, suppose you see, you know, a, a member at the church walk out of a bar one day. And you think, oh, well, they shouldn't, be, they shouldn't be there. They shouldn't be doing that. That'll give the rest of us Christians a bad name, you know, and that's not good. And then you go and confront them about it. Well, and then it turns out that they were going there to help someone to preach to someone, to have them stop going to the bar. Maybe they had an alcoholic uh, brother or sister or something, and they were going there to help somebody else, not to get drunk for themselves, right? And so at first glance, a situation could look bad, and we read our own assumptions into it, and then we end up getting ourselves in trouble, and we lead to situations like this, because one of the things that we've seen is how, as these friends have talked, 
feelings are getting hurt. Toes are getting stepped on, right? And on both sides, they're being more blunt and more uh, harsh with one another. And, and that's obviously not helping the situation any. Pat. I was going to say, today if somebody say that to us, it wasn't true, we could sue them for defamation of character. You could, yeah. I think that might uh, cost you quite a bit of money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, times have changed. They have changed. And, and we, so we do live in a culture that is very um, quick and eager to sue. And so that, but that brings to mind, like, what, what should you do if someone sues you for your coat, right? Or sues you for something like that. We have verses about that, don't we? If someone takes legal action against you. Yeah, and if you're like yeah. a member of the church and somebody spreads it in the church, all the things he's saying and it didn't happen. Yeah. That's pretty serious. It is. Yeah, and so the really the key point in, in this part for us as, as those under the New Testament is to take away the fact that we need to think through things before we go and accuse someone of something, right? Now, there's... That's not to say that there's not a time and a place to confront someone about something, right? There certainly is, and the Bible gives us scriptures to back up and to guide us on our behavior on how to confront some, someone with something. But, you know, maybe with a little bit more gentleness up front, they could have gotten to the bottom of this a, a lot quicker, or at least come to a better place to understand that, Job isn't at fault. Maybe we don't understand exactly why he's enduring what he's enduring, but he's not at fault, right? So let's, let's continue on with the next few verses here. So starting in verse 13, Eliphaz says, But you say, what does God know? Can he judge through the thick darkness? Clouds are a hiding place for him, so he cannot see. And he walks on the vault of heaven. Will you keep the ancient path which wicked people have walked, who were snatched away before their time, whose foundations were washed away by a river? So once again, depending on your translation, it could say washed away by, by a flood there as well. So again, I, I get the feeling that maybe Eliphaz is thinking back to the flood, right? But notice what he's saying, accusing Job of in verse 13 and 14. He's attacking Job's theology, his understanding of God. What's he accusing Job of there? You two are like in a race to get your hands on. Oh, I can see him whenever he wants to. Go ahead, Matt. I, I think you had your hand up well, first. I think, um, I kind of forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> okay. Um, what was the question? <laughs> uh, so in, in 13 and 14, what what exactly is Eliphaz accusing Job of in regards to how he's viewing God? So it seems like he's saying um, that that Job is sort of arguing against God, and he kind of is, right? Because sure. they, they all sort of assume, both Job and his friends are assuming that God is doing this to Job. Right. And his friends are assuming that God is doing this to Job because Job sinned. And right. Job is assuming God is doing this to him for I don't know why. And he's right. all upset. Uh, so so with that sort of assumption, that wrong assumption in mind, because of course Satan's doing it. Sure. Um, he's, he's basically saying, well, God has brought these judgments on you. So he's saying you're wrong, but you're arguing against what God has said. Right. By saying, I'm not wrong. Yeah. I agree. And I also think that Eliphaz is hinting a little bit that he thinks that uh, that Job's a little bit naive, that, oh, you know, God is, God is way up in there, and he can't see through clouds, he can't see the bad things that I do, right? Which was a viewpoint that a lot of, you know, pagan peoples had at the time, right? Their, the way that they talked about their gods, they were much more human in personality, and and they had much more human characteristics. And if, if you could, you could hide from your God. You know, you could sneak and, and do things under the cover of darkness that those pagan gods wouldn't know, right? That's the way that they believe that gods work. And so Eliphaz is kind of accusing Job of being the same way, of, of thinking so simplistically about God that, you know, God can't see me, so God doesn't know what I did, you know? Which is really 
again, is really insulting to Job. And so he continues with that, and he says in verse 17, talking about these, these hypothetical wicked people, right? He says, they say to God, go away from us, and what can the Almighty do to them? Yet he filled their houses with good things, but the advice of the wicked is far from me. The righteous see and are glad. The innocent mock them, saying, truly our enemies are eliminated, and fire has consumed their abundance. Be reconciled with him and be at peace. Thereby, goodwill will come to you. And so, verse 17, again, he's, he's proposing what he thinks Job's attitude is, you know, telling God, go away from us, or what can the Almighty do, do to us, do to me, right? Which, again, I mean, this is a very common attitude that's in our society today, right? Where, you know, if people might believe in God, but they don't want to have anything to do with him. Or, you know, saying, what, what does God have to do with us? You know, why should I care about God? What's he doing for me? You know, again, very earthly attitudes that we saw way back in Job's time. And we know that Job was one of the, the earliest books there. And so even that far back, people had the same kind of attitudes that have continued. But now Eliphaz is saying that these wicked are going to be brought to a swift end, right? He says that a fire has consumed their abundance. And so he starts to wrap up his speech here with some actual good advice if Job was wicked, right? In verse 21, he says, be reconciled with him and be at peace, thereby good will come to you, right? That's actually excellent advice if you've done something wrong, if, if you're uh, not on the side of righteousness, right? If you get right with God, then you're going to be at a better place. You're going to have the peace that surpasses understanding and you can enjoy God's blessings, right? But again, he's making this assumption that Job has separated himself from God in some way. And that's really, that's really where the problem lies with Eliphaz, is that everything he's said, every speech he's made, has not changed. It's what Job, a couple chapters ago, was pleading with them about, was that you're not listening to me, right? Job wanted his friends to listen to him, but they keep ignoring what he's saying and falling back on the fact that they, they just can't see past the fact that these terrible things have happened to Job and they just can't think of anything else that would cause something like that beyond divine punishment. And they are so certain of that that they just keep preaching to Job that he needs to change those ways. Other thoughts or comments before we read more? Okay. Okay. So he continues on here. In verse 22, he says, Please receive instruction from his mouth and put his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. If you remove injustice far from your tent and you put your gold in the dust and the gold of a fear among the stones of the brook, then the Almighty will be your gold and abundant silver to you. For then you will take pleasure in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. You will pray to him and he will hear you and you will pay your vows. You will also decide something and it will be established for you and light will shine on your ways. When they have brought you low, you will speak with confidence and he will save the humble person. He will rescue one who is not innocent and he will be rescued due to the, clean, to, due to the cleanness of your hands. So this is actually a really passionate and well-written section by Eliphaz. This is a very uh, moving and wise bit of advice that he puts out here, right? We read through the book of Job and we tend to think his friends are mean and cruel and dumb, but this is, this is good advice, right? And maybe this is coming from that, you know, the, the book of Proverbs type of wisdom that he's quoting, but we look to the book of Proverbs for wisdom too. It's good wisdom. 
It's just sad that this great advice that Eliphaz is giving to his friend is marred by the fact that he's built his entire case on a bad assumption. You know, this is really, really helpful advice, and it, it's a great thing to, to look at and to go to. And, you know, honestly, it's, it's probably a passage that we don't think to go to for help, for repentance. But it really is a great section on something that needs to be done on our part. But again, this is all predicated on the fact that he's assuming that Job was a sinner, uh, that he's done some terrible, wicked thing, and that he needs to repent. And that's, that's just not the case. Thoughts or comments here? Okay. So go ahead then and turn over to the next chapter here. Job chapter 23. So for, for the moment, we've wrapped up Eliphaz. And Job speaks up again, as is the pattern in, in the book of Job. We go from one friend to Job and back and forth. And Job says, starting in 23 verse 1, it says, Then Job responded, Even today my complaint is rebellion. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew how to find him, that I might come to his home. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn the words which he would answer and perceive what he would tell me. So I think that this is a little interesting. Now, verse 1 is saying that Job is responding to what Eliphaz says. But honestly, from the way it's written, it kind of feels to me like he's ignoring him. Because he's not directly answering the things that Eliphaz has said. Eliphaz, again... To recap chapter 22, Eliphaz basically says, Job, you're arrogant and prideful. You've sinned. You've done terrible, wicked things. Here's a couple of them that I have reason to believe you've done, right? Here are some terrible, wicked things you've done, and you need to get yourself right with God to repent and fix your life. That's everything that essentially Eliphaz is getting at. But then Job opens up here and just says, I wish that I could come before God. I wish I could be in his presence. I wish I could make my case to him. I wish I could voice those things to him. And in verse 5, that I would learn the words that he would answer. So Job's sincere desire here, and it really has been this way since this entire conversation started. Job's desire is to hear from God, not Eliphaz, not Bildad. I'm actually forgetting the third one. Who's our third? Elphaz, Bildad. Those guys. Those guys. His friends. He's looking for godly answers. He's not looking for earthly answers. He's not looking for answers that come from men. Because very clearly we see that those are wrong, right? Um, just from the fact that Eliphaz was accusing him of all these untrue crimes. And so, yeah. Job is, is calling out here to God. And I would also say that if you notice, he's, he's kind of started the chapter this way, but he's starting to use images again. And remember, Job is a book of poetry as well. He's starting to use these images to draw our mind to more of a courtroom kind of scene. The court of God, right? He's saying, I want to plead my case to him. I want to debate this with God. And we know that one of the ways that Hebrew, po Hebrew poetry works is that it repeats themes. And we've seen in past chapters uh, that he actually used this same theme before. He was talking about testifying in, in court. He was looking for an arbiter, someone to intercede on behalf of him and God. And so this is a theme that Job has used uh, previously. And so he's starting to call our minds back to that once again. Uh, thought, excuse me, thoughts or comments before I drop down a little bit further here. Okay. And so he says in verse 6, Would he contend with me by the greatness of his power? No, surely he would pay attention to me. 
So we can kind of see here, Job is uh, almost debating back and forth with himself. And remember, we've said this before, but Job's kind of on a very emotional roller coaster, and he's he's very conflicted. And we see that voiced in a lot of his speeches, where you know he depends on God, but God seems to be pulled away from him, and so he's hurt by this. But also, he wants God. God is his destroyer and his savior at the same time. So Job is feeling this spiritual uh, conflict. And so he says, There the upright would argue with him, and I would be free of my judge forever. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he acts on the left, I cannot see him. He turns to the right, but I cannot see him. But he knows the way I take. When he has put me to the test, I will come out as gold. And so let's back up to verse uh, 7 here. So verse 7 in the New American Standard that I'm reading from, the verse says that the upright would argue with him and I would be free of my judge forever. That translation kind of makes it sound as if, you know, he, he doesn't want to be around God. And I, I actually, this is one of the few times when I think that the King James Version actually has a better translation uh, than the New American Standard. So if you have a King James Bible, it says in verse 7, There the righteous might dispute with him, instead of argue, which I think is more of maybe the tone that Job is going for. And it also says, so that I would be delivered forever from my judge. And so the idea is not that he wants to be away from God, but more delivered from the judgment, right? That he would have things made right with his judge, and so that he is no longer in the judgment stage of this, that he's, that he's free, that he's, his name is cleared. That's more of the tone that I think it's actually after. Does anyone feel differently or disagree? I know we hop back and forth from versions quite a bit. Pat? I think uh, when a person's sick, like he's very sick, mm -hmm. and he's miserable, and it gives you a time to reflect on yourself because there's nothing else you can do. You're not well enough to do anything. And yeah. He's lost everything. He doesn't have any animals to take care of, no servants, and he's just uh, kind of pathetic. And so he's contemplating all this stuff that he never maybe thought of for a long time. Yeah. And he's also saying here, you know, he, he's talking about wanting to go to where God is to make his case, right? But he's saying, I don't understand where God is or what his ways are. So basically, I, I'm confused by what God is doing right now. He says that in verses or in verse nine. But in verse 10, notice he still knows that God is in control of everything and understands everything because he says, speaking of God, but he knows the ways that I take. So God knows what I'm doing, even if I don't know what he's doing. And notice how, he, again, he's transitioning to this confidence again. So Job keeps going from despair and, man, my life is really hard and, and it, you know, death would be a welcome right now. But he keeps going back and we see his shining faith come through. And verse 10 is, is going to lead us into a section where we see that again. And notice how it starts to go up. It says, when he has put me to the test, I will come out as gold. And I think this may be the closest that Job has come to actually hitting the nail on the head here in terms of what's actually happening. It's a test, right? Now, it's a, it's a test of Job's faith. God is confident in Job, right? He told Satan to consider my servant Job, right? And so he is, uh, he is being tested a bit. And Job's confident that he'll come through this, that when everything's said and done, that his name will be cleared, that he'll be found to be innocent. And again, we've, we've said this before, but Job kind of yo-yos back and forth between being really, really depressed and being really, really confident. And just in the way that typical Hebrew poetry is written, it kind of, in the middle of a chapter, it kind of goes like that. Right? So you kind of start out low, and then it's high, and then low, and then that kind of repeats through all of Job's, uh, Job's conversations. But we're going to pick up next week on that statement, and we're going to explore why Job feels so confident 
and he's going to come out like gold. So any other uh, thoughts, comments, or questions before we wrap up here and close for the night? Okay. Well, I appreciate all the participation. And if you'd like, uh, we're going to transition now from our Bible class to a time of invitation. And so I want all of you to take a moment and just think about memory verses. So I think that everyone here probably has a couple memory verses that they know by heart that are their favorites for one reason or another, right? I think, I think everyone feels that way. How many of you, among your favorite memory verses, have 2 Kings 21 and 13? I don't see a lot of hands going up. 2 Kings 21 and 13. Well, I bet by the end of the night it will be. Turn over there, if you will, to 2 Kings chapter 21 and verse 13. 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 13. Uh, this is the word of God, and he says, And I will stretch over Jerusalem, the line of Samaria. I will plummet the house of Ahab. I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth the dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. That's biblical proof that it's a man's job to do the dishes. Mm -hmm. How many of you women wish you had had that in your back pocket at some point, right? Yeah, I guarantee a lot. I see a lot of people writing that verse down. Yeah. Kind of a comical example, but the reason I bring that to your attention tonight is the fact that there are verses in the Bible that can still surprise you that, you, that you don't remember. I'm sure we've all read through the book of 2 Kings before, but it's just not something that our mind was drawn to at the time. Maybe we were thinking more about the characters in the story, or maybe we were thinking about the spiritual application on a broader sense. But whatever the reason, there are things that we miss, which is one of the reasons it's so important to keep going over books again and again, even if we've read them before. It's why one of my favorite memory verses is 2 Timothy 2.15, which is to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, Amen. rightly dividing the word of truth. I love that verse. That verse is very good for me because it reminds me of the importance of studying. It's the importance of being able to understand God's word and not to just understand it, but to use it correctly. Everyone here has been baptized, and so really more of what I want to invite you to do is to keep up with your daily Bible study. It's something that challenges me. I try, and there are days that I miss, and then I feel bad because I didn't study my Bible that day. And it's something that I personally have been trying to work harder on and work more on in this year. And we're coming up on a time of year where everybody is making New Year's resolutions. And so I'd encourage you, if you're like me and you need a little bit more encouragement for this one particular aspect, to study the Bible more. To try and incorporate just a verse or two each day into your study. And you'd be surprised at what you find. Things like 2 Kings. There are different verses in the Bible that you never thought were there or might surprise you because you missed them the first time around. So I would, continue, I would encourage you to continue studying. Now, we do have this time of invita uh, invitation not just to encourage us to study more, to glorify God and edify one another, but also in a time of repentance, if need be, or just for prayers of help. It's really a time that we offer for any kind of service or help that we as your brethren uh, can provide to you. If there is any kind of need, I would uh, ask that you come forward and make it known while we sing this song of invitation.